I never looked at anyone as a role model. I don't know, maybe you could say I'm stubborn or egotistic, but I, the way I come from, I think that it's, it's weak to look up to someone else and say, he's my idol and I want to be like him. But there is someone Mike Tyson has looked up to for several years. The man who rescued him from the streets, straightened out his life, and taught him everything about boxing. The late Cus D'Amato. D'Amato harnessed Tyson's raw power and honed his skills. But there was more to their relationship than just boxing, as Mike Tyson explains. When you think of my career as a boxer, it's not even a tenth of what Cus D'Amato meant to me or to any, all other people that he influenced. It was more like the boxing, the boxing part was just so, so limited. It was, it, was, it, was, it was really nothing compared to the, the humanity we had between one another. He was my father, he was my father. And there's nothing else I could tell you. He loved me, I loved him. You know, the man lived a, a long life, 77 years. Longer than probably that I'll live. And as far as, you know, he's gone now. And you know, the, the show must go on, you know. There's nothing I could do or anyone else could do about it. The show must go on. Judges are Billy Graham, Bernie Friedkin, and Eva Shane. Now look at the height yeah. difference, at least six inches. What does Tyson have to do to get inside? Do you know what that means to Tyson? That means that he has in front of him a very large target. Okay. <laughs> Scheduled for 10, but don't go away. Coming in, got in a short left hook. There's the big left hook, and that rocks Sammy's yeah, gap it sure early. Did. It sure did. He's a right hand. He's, he's yeah, going to work. Wobbly. He's taking his time. He's pinpointing his punches. He's not uh, he's not over anxious. That's the first punch he's missed so far. Look at the legs. Look at where the power comes from yeah. when he bends and, and gets his body into those punches. You gotta watch this one real close. Blood coming from the nose of Sammy Scaff already. A big left hook got in there. He might have broken his nose That's already. That's right. That's right. It looks bad. Scaff is on the run. Blood just pouring down from the nose of Sammy Scaff. Tyson does not throw wild punches, Sam. That's Big left hook. Left One. Left. And there is Two. Scaff down. down. Three. Four. The count is five. For the rest of the year. Six. The count seven. is seven. This Eight. one's over. Nine. This one is over. It's all over. He tried to make it. Sammy Scaff tried to get up. His nose oh is cut. Look at the side oh of his nose my. there. He's uh, breathing and nose is just pouring out. I, I gotta believe he broke his nose with one of those I left hooks. I think that might even be a tear on the side of that nose. You didn't keep us very long or you didn't keep a lot of the folks who came to see you very long. There are a lot of people who say that uh, you are ready right now to fight anybody in the top ten. How do you feel about that? I feel the same also. But the problem is, I, I only been fighting nine months, and I'm only 19 years old. I'm fighting now, someone nine, fighting only nine months and 19 years old, now they want me to fight for the title, they want me to fight a contender. That's absurd in boxing business. Uh -huh. That's just absurd. Yeah, but you're not, the, you're not the usual heavyweight. You're an unusual heavyweight. So if you think you're ready to fight in the top 10, why are you against it? Because my job is to fight, and my manager's job is to manage. Uh -huh. If my manager went in the ring and fight Sammy, scaff he wouldn't look so well and wouldn't do so well and i feel the same doing his job okay now let's say uh, let's say that uh, tomorrow morning uh your manager said i have a world title fight for you there are three champions michael spinks tony tubbs and pinkland thomas of the three which would you rather fight i fight anyone my manager choose for me to fight uh -huh. because if he feels confident i could beat him i feel confident i could beat him also Mike, you seem to have a good time. Do you enjoy boxing? Uh, do you, do you yeah, think you, about it all the you time? You have to love it to be the best at it. You have to love the sport. Mm -hmm. Anyone that's just in there to go for the money, it's good to be successful and have financial status. But if you only go in there for the money, you're going to reach a, a certain status. And I'm in there for greatness and peace of mind. And I'm sure I, I love the sport. If I went in there just for the financial back, back, background, I wouldn't do as well as I'm doing now.
frustration during the fight for you? Because, you know, I never get frustrated because I know we have a 10-round limit. And the, cr the crop of heavyweight nowadays having a little difficulty going the full 10 rounds. And the way they, they have it planned in their mind to beat me is to jab, hot chop, and grab me. But it's 10 rounds, and eventually, I'm going to catch them. And he's just not going to come in firing, leaving himself open as he was able to do against lesser opponents. Ferguson in his 10 round loss to Carl the Truth Williams, a TKO defeat, out of the city, was in trouble in both the first and 10th rounds, and now he's in trouble here. Blood coming out from the nose of Jesse Ferguson, the right uppercut. As I think you're absolutely right, Alex. It appeared that the nose of Jesse Ferguson was broken by the brilliant uppercut. Another look. Tyson punching from very close quarters. The, the obvious punch right here is the uppercut. He turns around. Digs right to the body and then comes straight up with the right uppercut. Tyson has a tendency to turn left hand, and he turned left hand to, la to land that combination and dropped Ferguson, and, and I think really just accelerated the pace of the fight, turned the tide, and I, I don't see how Ferguson can fight much longer in that I condition. I went up in his brain. I went to go up in his brain. <laughs> because I always thought about that punch. I always, I always watch, listen to the doctors on television, and that's my friends, and they say when the nose going to brain, the consequences of him getting up right away. He didn't want to fight. He looked incoherent. He no more salt and no decided to continue to fight and throw punches. All right, thank you, referee Luis Rivera. And go get a clean shirt. It's got blood stains all over it. We bring in now Jim Jacob, the manager of Mike Tyson. And very quickly, what did you learn today that you might not have known before about your young protege? Well, I've seen him go 10 or 12 rounds in training. I always knew he could do the 10 or 12 rounds, but it's different in uh, a ring in front of television cameras. And the thing that impressed me mostly about Mike's performance today, I always, I've always known he's an incredible puncher. His punching power defies description. But I love the way he paced himself. I was very proud of him, uh, proud of him today because if the toughest thing in the world to fight Jim is a fighter who doesn't want to fight, who doesn't try to win. And from round two, three, and four, the other fighter merely wanted to survive. He had no intention of winning the fight. He just didn't want to fight. And in boxing, that is the toughest guy in the world to fight. All right, congratulations to you. It's worth noting, incidentally, that because of a strategy devised by Jim Jacob and others, Mike Tyson will be fighting 12 more times, perhaps, before the end of this year? Oh, I would say he would be fighting a minimum of 20 times. Minimum 20 before the end of the year. He fights... <laughs>